the Ortho PAC hosted by Sam Dyer. Welcome to the Ortho PAC where we discuss up-to-date orthopedic topics for the busy clinician. I invite you to sit back and relax as I attempt to fill in the gaps between education, current events, and real-world practice. Today's topic is osteoporosis, and I'd like to welcome Catherine Sweeney, who's a colleague, a PA colleague. Catherine specializes in bone health and osteoporosis management and is a certified clinical densitometrist. Catherine, welcome to our podcast. Hi, happy to be here. This week's topic is on osteoporosis. I recently had an 80-plus-year-old patient who was standing at the door, answered the door, twisted and felt pain and had ongoing pain in her hip and knee and back, and it got so bad she came in to see me. And I got screening x-rays, and she had a femoral neck fracture uh, just from standing and twisting. That's her osteoporosis. She's had some compression fractures, and, and it's been really debilitating for her. So I wanted to have a talk on osteoporosis. May is National Osteoporosis Month, so we, it's a timely topic. I think most, if not all, of our listeners are familiar with osteoporosis and osteopenia, but it's a tough problem, and it remains a significant problem throughout the country. So... Catherine, I, I was hoping you might review for our listeners bone pathophysiology and the uh, cellular and hormonal regulation of bone metabolism. Absolutely. So osteoporosis essentially means porous bone. There is literally not a lot of bone there. This is regulated by a process of bone resorption or bone loss and bone formation. Our bodies are constantly, constantly losing bone and rebuilding new bone and losing bone and rebuilding new bone. That process is regulated by many different factors in our body, predominantly though by the hormones estrogen and parathyroid hormone and to a lesser degree testosterone. And these hormones and these signaling pathways either stimulate osteoclasts, which are the cells that are destroying the bone or resorbing the bone, and they regulate the formation of osteoblasts, which I call those the bone builders, which essentially are helping with bone formation. So it's a complex process of the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts talking to each other through various signaling pathways that then allow the body to essentially get rid of the old bone and build some new. And osteoporosis is when there is an imbalance where the body is resorbing bone or getting rid of the bone faster than how quickly it is building the bone. And so you get a net loss. And a lot of that is, again, regulated with estrogen, which is why this is so much more prevalent in women when we lose estrogen after menopause that significantly lowers the rate of bone formation, thereby putting a woman more so at risk for developing osteoporosis. Let's talk about diagnosing osteoporosis. I know DEXA scan is, has been around for a while. Is that still the gold standard? And along with that, what other modalities are available? Lastly, Third question would be, what are the indications for ordering bone mineral density testing? DEXA is still the gold standard as far as screening and diagnosing osteoporosis. It's a simple test, uses x-ray technology, takes about 10 minutes. There's no, no dye, no needles. The patient lies there essentially on the table and the machine moves above. And that is a tool that we have to not only screen, but also diagnose osteoporosis and also help us to monitor patients when they have started treatment to see if the treatment is efficacious or not. Other modalities we have are CT scanners. There are some CT scanner programs that can be added to those machines to help diagnose osteoporosis. And there also is some MRI technology. Some common one that some people have had is an ultrasound of the heel. That is a very convenient, portable way to potentially do some screening for osteoporosis, but truthfully is not reliable and you certainly cannot make a diagnosis with that modality. As far as who should get a scan, the current guidelines recommend a bone density scan, truthfully, for 
any woman over the age of 65 or any man over the age of 70. Of course, those ages can be lowered if people have any of those risk factors for osteoporosis. So if someone has already suffered a fragility fracture in their postmenopausal, if someone has been a lifelong smoker or is on chronic prednisone for other disease processes, there's multiple reasons that someone should be screened for this disease. Let's talk about treatment for osteoporosis. What are some maybe non-pharmacologic treatments and then pharmacologic treatments? And hopefully you'll be able to tell our listeners the difference between anti-resorptive and anabolic agents. So again, when we talk about treating osteoporosis, it is, it is more than just the medication. It's also lifestyle modifications that we know can help the patient. So non-pharmacological treatments we can utilize are certainly making sure the patient is getting enough calcium and vitamin D. Those are our building blocks. We need those for the patient to be able to form bone and create more bone. So I always counsel my patients on diet and we look at what they're eating, making sure they're getting some calcium rich foods, which can of course include your dairy products, green vegetables, broccoli, some fatty fish, eggs. There's actually quite a variety of foods that contain calcium. And the same with vitamin D, not quite as many foods that have vitamin D, but there are some. And certainly the sunshine is a, a great source of natural vitamin D. For patients who maybe don't get those things from their diet for whatever reason, supplements can be helpful. We want to aim for around 1,200 milligrams of calcium per day, either through supplement and or food. And vitamin D, we usually recommend about 1,000 units. Now that can be dependent, of course, on the patient's blood level. If someone is low, then they certainly may need more in a supplement or some people do get enough without a supplement, but lab work can help determine that. So those are certainly things we can do to help with our bone density and reducing fracture risk. Also reducing any harmful behaviors. So if someone is a smoker, certainly want to counsel them on trying to quit or if they take an excessive alcohol or excessive caffeine, we want to try to mitigate those factors as well. Being sedentary can put someone at higher risk for osteoporosis. So exercise is a great uh, natural treatment, so to speak, which helps to stimulate new bone growth and tells your body, hey, I'm being used. I need to make more bone. So exercise is a great non-pharmacological way to help improve bone density. And things that help the bones in particular are, you may have heard the term thrown around often is weight-bearing exercises. So basically anything that puts a, a stress or causes impact on the bone. So walking, Zumba, aerobics, weights for the upper body, there's actually some really good studies with yoga and Pilates uh, with helping improve bone density as well. So those are great ways that people can naturally help to improve the bone density. With pharmacological therapy, there's a plethora of medicines there as well. We thankfully have choices now, many more than when Fosamax first came out 30 years ago. So we have Two categories, like you've mentioned before, anti-resorptive medicines, which help to essentially stop further bone loss. And then we have what are called anabolic medications, which actually help to stimulate bone growth and help the body build bone more efficiently and faster. The anti-resorptive medications, people may be familiar with the bisphosphonates. Those are alendronate, abandronate, and residronate. Those are oral medications that the patient can take. There also is an intravenous formulation called zoledronic acid that is also a bisphosphonate that is given through an IV. This is especially helpful for those patients who may have reflux or gastrointestinal problems 
which can be aggravated sometimes by the oral medications. Another anti-resorptive is denosumab. This is an injection that is given in the office every six months, which also helps to stop further bone loss from happening. The anabolic therapies, we have three of these now. One of them is called teriparatide, and another is called abaloparatide. These are actually parathyroid analogs. So they are pieces of the parathyroid hormone. They are given as daily subcutaneous injections for a two-year course of treatment. The newest anabolic is romazosumab. This is a sclerostin inhibitor, and this is given as two injections that the patient receives, one in each arm, once a month for a year. And this medicine is fairly unique in that it helps stimulate the bone growth as well as stops the bone loss. So it is the first dual acting medication that we have. Great information and the weight bearing exercise and surprise smoking is bad for your bones like everything. So it's great that you're able to counsel those folks. Fracture liaison services. This has been around our conferences So my experience in orthopedics is we treat the fractures. We're not preventing them. That's always been the mindset, and it's a tough one to fix. I think that fracture liaison services are very important for orthopedic groups, and I was hoping you might touch on that a little bit. Yes, fracture liaison services are certainly becoming a little bit more widespread, and these are basically programs that practices can implement to try and essentially stop or close the treatment gap of osteoporosis. As you've mentioned, unfortunately, this is a a very underdiagnosed problem and even more so an undertreated problem. And fracture liaison services can help not only identify patients who need to be screened and treated, but then also help follow these patients They are often led by a physician assistant or a nurse practitioner. This is actually a really great opportunity for PAs and NPs to take on a little bit more of a a leadership role. And often there is a nurse or medical assistant, uh, which helps with the coordination of care. And of course, often teams of physical therapists, uh, depending on your practice, or other healthcare providers that can help form a team for these patients. So the goal of the fracture liaison service is to, number one, identify the patient who qualifies to be screened, then hopefully implement some treatment if needed, and then follow through with the patient and coordinate their care with their primary care doctors or any other specialists. So it's really a team hands-on approach. These fracture liaison services take all different forms due to the nature of how we all are practicing in different areas and hospital settings versus outpatient clinics or primary care or orthopedics. The framework may look different for each practice, but the goals remain the same. And there's some really lovely blueprints out there now for providers who want to start one of these programs. The American Orthopedic Association has a a very robust program called Own the Bone. So a practice can join Own the Bone and they will be given tools and resources to help start one of these services. The National Osteoporosis Foundation also has a FLS program where you, again, as a healthcare provider, can get resources that you need to start your own FLS service. And the International Osteoporosis Foundation has a program called Capture the Fracture that organizations can join. And uh, they have a lovely program where you also can get a mentor of sorts, uh, another practice who maybe has been very successful with this so far and can help implement these programs. Our fracture liaison service here at an orthopedic practice certainly makes great sense. You're already seeing these patients for fractures, presumably. 
Um, so it's a, a great way to then be able to capture those patients and helpfully help them prevent another one from happening before they even walk out the door. Like you said, you know, the patients are there and this is still such a widely underdiagnosed disease. And I think as PAs can really do a great service in helping these patients and identify these patients and and also take a bit of a load, you know, off the primary care doctors as well and providers who have so much on their plates already because it is that these fractures and especially those hip fractures, gosh, they can be so debilitating for patients. So many of them will need walkers or canes or will have to go to a assisted living facility. They lose their independence. They lose all the, the joy of what the activities they used to be able to do. And it, it's really devastating for these patients. And so if we can prevent this for them, keep their sense of independence, that is huge for the patient. I uh, would just be sure to educate yourselves on what these risk factors are and see, you know, if you have that conversation with the patient. If you're seeing someone who just fractured their wrist, you know, hey, you know, let's, this could have been related to osteoporosis. Let's get you screened. You know, we don't want this to happen to you again. So just having that awareness, I think, will help close that treatment gap that unfortunately is still quite wide right now. You know, think about this, our listeners. I, I know a lot of people think, well, we're here to treat, uh, not to prevent, but but really think about your poor patients. I mean, get them in to uh, someone and get their bone density done so you can help them out. Catherine, thanks for your time today. I'll be talking to you soon. All right. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you for joining the Ortho PAC podcast. Extremities in the Carolinas, Trauma for General Orthopedics, May 21st and 22nd, 2021. Check out the PAOS.org website for details.